Well, for those of you who this is your first time or it's your first time in a really long time, my name is Destiny, and along with my husband, Philip, um, we're the lead pastors at North Point Community Church, which is where your friend brought you. And we are so glad that you are are here. We are so glad that you are here. Um, We had a great night on Friday night. Girl on Purpose. Did any of you come? Was it fun? Yes, I see some shirts and some fun things. We had a great time as women getting together, and I'm believing that God's going to speak some more about purpose to us this Sunday. We're we're in a series of talks um, about what God does when we come together as a church. It's called Tales from the Inn. And and that story, that that name comes out of the story of the Good Samaritan, Samaritan, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells. And The Good Samaritan goes like this. There was a man who um, was traveling um, on the road, and he was set upon by robbers and thieves, and he was beaten up, and he was thrown on the side of the road. And lucky for him, two very upstanding members of the community came by, but unlucky for him, they did not stop by. And then a despised Samaritan, somebody who was an outcast in this time period, somebody who would not have been the hero of the story stopped and picked this man up and carried him to an inn. And at the inn, he gave this man to the innkeeper and he said, look, take care of him. Do everything you can for him. Here's a little bit of payment up front, but if it costs more than this, when I come back, I will pay what he owes in full. Don't charge him a thing. And of course, we know that Jesus is the despised Samaritan because he was despised and he was rejected. He died a cruel death on a cross for us. And he rescues each and every one of us ditch dwellers. And he brings us to a place of safety. But we go from being in seekers to in keepers because the church is meant as part of this big story to be a safe place, to be the in at the crossroads of life, a safe place, a place that has a big mission, a place where anybody can come and can find a loving Savior, a place where we're not afraid of imperfection because we all know, hello, we're imperfect. If you don't know that, let me be the first to tell you. We all have issues, don't we? And yet when we come in this place, we are unified by the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ loves us and has purposed us and has a plan for us. See, when Jesus came to earth and he died, he didn't stay dead. See, as Jesus followers, what we believe is that he was resurrected three days later and that when he rose from the grave, he took with him the power of death and he took over all of those things that could conquer us and that we are more than a conqueror because of him. And so we have all the power that we need to live a life of purpose. And so we've been talking about the end and what happens at the end. We've had these beautiful stories, and we're going to be putting them up on the YouTube channel after this series is over. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't had a chance to listen, because it's wonderful to hear testimonies of people being healed and and wholeness and all of those different things. It's wonderful to hear about how somebody was led to forgive in a situation that seemed unforgivable, how the community was there for somebody who was dealing with suicidal thoughts and depression. It's wonderful to hear those stories because we all know what it is to need something, right? We all know what it is to be an in-seeker. But there's more to it than that. See, the in is not a natural thing. You don't just like drive down the road and be like, oh, look at that. A La Quinta is popping out of the ground. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that great? No, we all know that inns, that places that are set for people to stay, you have to build those. There have to be plans. There has to be structure around it. It's intentional. They have to be created. Inns have to be created. And here at North Point, we have a mission, don't we? Here at North Point, we have a mission, don't we? 
And that mission is creating Christ-centered, culture-changing community. And creating is hard work. And creating takes everybody. But do you know what happens when I lean in to creating? God starts to recreate some things inside of me. God starts to change some things inside of me. So maybe you walked in needing an answer for yourself and you're kind of going, Destiny, you just don't know. You don't know how, how messed up I am or you don't know how overloaded I am or you don't know how busy I am. Just hold all that for a minute and let's lean into God's word and let's look at the way that he describes creating an end or creating a Christ-centered culture changing community. And we can see this beautiful picture in Mark 6. And I'm just going to go through it and we're going to pull out some lessons for the process of the supernatural, the process of seeing an end created at the crossroads of life for those in our community. And so this is the way the story starts. Jesus has sent his followers, his disciples, out two by two to preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they have gone out. They've seen people healed. They've seen all kinds of stuff. They are excited. I mean, they are coming back from the mission trip just ready, but they're also really tired. And Jesus acknowledges this, and he says, you know, they're kind of tired. I I think that we should have some time away. And so he says, look, guys, we're going to walk away from the crowds, and we're going to go have some time alone. We're going to go have some Jesus time. We all love our Jesus time, right? So we're going to go have some time. You know, we're just going to kind of lean in together, just rest up a little bit. But there was a flaw in their plan, because when they got to the place where they were going to rest, the crowds had found out that Jesus was coming, and they had run ahead, and they had gotten all prepared, and they were so excited that Jesus was there. And Jesus being who Jesus is, he saw them, and he had compassion on them, and he began to teach them. And he began to teach them until it was late in the day. So The disciples looked around, and it starts to get a little bit late in the day, and and they're going, okay, we haven't had our Jesus time yet, and this is what I think is going on. You know, we haven't had our Jesus time yet. Oh, my goodness, it's getting late. (gasps) That means the people are going to have to eat, and once they eat, they're going to go away, and then we're going to have some time alone with Jesus. This is going to be great. Okay, let's go tell him our plan. So they go to Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, look. All of these people are here, and they've been listening to you. It's been great, so great, and um, they, they're hungry. So why don't you send them away so that they can get food? Good plan? They saw the problem, but they didn't see the problem the way that Jesus saw the problem. See, the first step to creating an end, the first step to inviting the super of God into our natural, this first step, the first part of the process of the supernatural is just to see the problem. But we can't see it the way we see it. We have to see it the way Jesus sees it. See, when Jesus saw the masses waiting for him, he didn't see a burden. He saw an opportunity, and he leaned in, and he began to preach and began to give them what they needed, and he filled their souls. And then suddenly he was presented with a situation where their bellies are empty, and the disciples want to send them away as though it is harder for Jesus to meet natural needs than soulish needs. And they say, no, you know, you may have been able to fill their hearts, but but their bellies is something else. They need to go somewhere else. And Jesus just didn't see it that way. And instead, he turns to them. And I just want you to imagine being them for a minute, okay? I mean, you're tired. You've heard Jesus preach all day, and it's been wonderful, but now you're thinking you're about to send the crowds away, and you're going to get some rest. And you say, hey, Jesus, they're hungry. Send them away. And Jesus turns to you and says, you feed them. Me? Okay. So, Jesus, you know, you're, I I don't know how good you are with numbers and all of, I mean, you created it, but whatever, you know, I, 
So there's a lot of people here. I mean, the Bible says 5,000 men plus women and children. That's a lot of people. And so they bring Jesus their excuse, right? They bring Jesus their excuse. They say, hey, look, Jesus, it would take half of a year's wages to feed all these people. Do you want us to go and and buy the food? Do you want us to go and spend that much money? See, Jesus wants us to own the gap. Sometimes when we see an opportunity, we can go, oh, man, that's amazing. God should do something about that. Oh, man, you know, that's just, that's really unfortunate. I really think that there should be an organization that takes care of that. Oh, man, well, I just, man, you know, I I wish somebody would invite my neighbors to church. Man, you know, we should have an outreach to invite my neighbors to church. Own the gap. Own the gap. And that's what Jesus is telling them, own the gap. But, But there's a challenge to owning the gap is that often we don't have everything we need to fill in the gap, or we think we don't. Because, see, excuses are always relative. They said half a year's wages. Whose wages? Everybody in this room doesn't make the same amount, right? I mean, whose wages? Whose wages? Half a year's of whose wages? And oh, on top of that, we're talking to the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. We're talking to one who has limitless resources, and their answer is, we don't have enough. I know you can heal people, Jesus, and I know you can do all of these other things, but we don't have enough. You don't have enough. But Jesus is so great because he doesn't even answer their flawed excuse. Instead, he gives them the next step. He shows them to see the opportunity. He tells them to go ahead and own that gap. But then he gives them the next step. And the next step is that you need to take inventory. You have to take inventory. See what is in your hands. He says, look, look around, see what you have, see what's in your hands. And so they bring him this little boy's lunch. It's five loaves and two fishes. And so we, we, he brings them this, this little lunch. I don't think they looked very hard to find the food, just my personal opinion, because like there's this little boy and they're like, he has a lunch, let's take that. Okay, here, this is what we've got. Five loaves and two fishes. It's not enough. See, Jesus, I can't do it. It's not enough. This is the truth, is that everything you need to accomplish what God has called you to do, everything you need to stand in the gap that he has brought to your attention, everything you need, he has already given you. Take inventory. Everything we need as a community to be able to be impactful in this city is in this room. Every single thing we need, we we have to take inventory. We have to look around and see what it is that we have in our hands. And then he creates structure around that. He has them all sit down in 50s and 100s and, and all of those different things. And he has them sit down in groups. Why? Because if he didn't create structure, there probably would have been a lot of danger. If you try to feed thousands of people without structure, somebody's going to get killed. There's going to be a stampede. This happens all the time, right? And Jesus is going, okay, before I perform this miracle, I'm going to create a structure so that the miracle doesn't cause more problems than the problem that existed before it. And sometimes we can just see the problem and want to own the gap and we kind of take inventory, but we just want to jump right in to seeing God do the supernatural and we want to skip over the structure. There's a reason why God put us into communities is because structure protects people. Structure allows us to make sure that nobody slips through the gaps. Structure allows us to all bring our talents together and allow God to do something amazing with it. It's important that we create structure. And then he invites the supernatural. Can't you imagine that moment? 
I mean, we know what's going to happen. The disciples don't yet. Okay? They gave Jesus a kid's lunch that they stole. I mean, I'm not saying that's what happened. We gave Jesus a kid's lunch. That's all we did. We gave Jesus a kid's lunch. And then he told us to tell everybody to sit down. Did you see any more food, John? No, not yet. Okay. What are these people going to do once they figure out we made them sit down? We don't have any food. I don't know. Can you run fast? I don't know. (laughs) But Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do. So he lifts the bread and the fish, and he gives thanks. And he invites power to come. Why did he do that? I mean, he's the son of God. He did that as an example for us. As an example for us. That after we've done everything we know to do. Because, you know, really, there's, there, if we were going to divide people into an arbitrarily two groups, there would be the people who see the opportunity and want to jump to the supernatural. And then we would see the people that see the opportunity and want to create the structure and do it all themselves and don't need to invite God into anything. And that's not who we're called to be either side. We're supposed to invite God into our gaps, into the issues, into the challenges we face, into the challenges you face in your home, in your business, in your school, in your life. God's solutions aren't limited to the church. The church is the hope of the world. We're supposed to teach the skills that you need to be successful everywhere you go. So he invites the supernatural. And then, I love this, then they take action. Then they start breaking the bread, and as they take action, more and more bread appears, and it just begins to develop, and everybody eats. And not only that, there's more than enough for everyone. What an incredible picture of the end. What an incredible picture of what happens when we invite God super into our natural. What an incredible process that Jesus lays out for us. And it's truly available for us today. Say, Destiny, how does that work? Let me tell you one of my favorite in creating stories. I have a friend of mine, he lives actually in pastors in England now. But when he was about 19 years old, he went to Bible school. And this was kind of a special Bible school in Malaysia. You would go for nine weeks, and then they would send you somewhere that didn't have a church, and you weren't supposed to leave until you'd planted one. Does that make anybody nervous? I mean, that makes me nervous on so many different levels. And so um, he's 19, and and he, he goes to his Bible school, and then he shows up in this place, and he's supposed to be planting a church, and he doesn't know what to do. And he calls the head of the mission, and he says, hey, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And the guy says, okay, what's in your hand? Because he had learned the first thing you do is take inventory. So the guy decided to be a little sarcastic, and he said, well, I have a guitar, and uh a basketball. How's that? That's all I've got. He said, okay, take that basketball, and I want you to go, and I want you to play every single day during the week. Just go out to the local playground. Play every single day. Meet people. Have a great time. Go out there early in the morning. Stay all day long. Just play basketball all week. And the 19-year-old boy is like, okay, yeah, I can do that. And then on Friday, invite everybody to come to a church service on Sunday. Okay, I'll do that. They're not going to come. And then next week, I can explain to you that it didn't work and all of that. So it's going to be fine. So Monday, he played basketball. Tuesday, he played basketball. Wednesday, he played basketball. Thursday, he played basketball. And Friday, he invited everybody to come to church, and they all accepted. (laughs) And now he was in trouble because he needed to learn how to play the guitar that he had. And he planted a church. Before he left, there was a self-sufficient community of Christ followers. That's an amazing thing. You may say, Destiny, yeah, but I'm not over on the other side of the world. But what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand that would fill a gap? What do you have in your hand that would make a difference? What do you have in your hand? And we all have something different. None of us are the same. If we look at 1 Corinthians 
12, four through seven, we see that we all have to play our part for God to do something through us. It says there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There's different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There's different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. What that means is that the gifts that each of us are given are given for the common good. They're given so that God can use them to make a difference on this earth, so that he can bring heaven to earth, so that he can fill the gaps in society. That's why the church is the hope of the world. It's because together we are on a mission that's bigger than any affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday was a, um, was a race. What's, what's the word? <laughs> Election. Thank you. Like I have, I wanted to say ballot, and I was like, it is not a ballot. You vote on a ballot. Yesterday was an election. Some of you are happy, and some of you aren't. That doesn't matter here. We are not a Republican church, and we are not a Democratic church, and we are not a Libertarian church, and we are not a Green church. We are a Jesus church, and we are all part of a mission that's bigger than any platform. End of story. That's the end. The end is about Jesus. The end is about working together for the common good. You know, one of my favorite moments when we got to, as a community, plan an end at a crossroads of a big need was was about seven years ago. I was standing in the front foyer with um, with Pastor Clarissa, and and, uh, we were talking, and it was during the week, and this lady came in and was a little bit distraught, And she said, I need help. And we thought, well, maybe she needs prayer. Maybe she needs whatever. She goes, I need a church to gather uniforms in North Bossier because we need to give away uniforms, and I don't have a church that will help me gather uniforms. Well, Clarissa and I are really soft touches if you want us to gather anything. I mean, we'll gather cans. We'll gather coats. We'll gather anything. And she said, I want to gather uniforms. We said, okay, great. We'll gather uniforms, but you don't need us to do anything else, right? Nope, just gather them. So, like, we just have to gather them, and you'll do all the rest, right? Yes, just gather them. That is not how it went down. So, a little while later, a few weeks later, we realized we are not the gathering people. We are the gathering, sorting, labeling, putting together, inviting the schools, and uh, line, giving outer people. We are all those people. All of us are those people. And at that time, honestly, we had one person on staff, one person to do all this. Oh, God, I don't know if we can do it. And and do we even have enough people to even get a sufficient amount of uniforms? There's going to be people showing up who need uniforms. God, how, how is this going to happen? Okay, what's in our hands? Well, we knew we had a gym where we could sort things and where we could give away things. We, we knew that we had some people who were amazing at administration that we could bring in and getting involved. And, and we had a copier. We could print flyers. So we, we're like, okay, we're going to take what's in our hands and we're going to see what God does. And that first year, we gave away 300 uniforms. And you guys, you would have thought that, that, that literally there was an angelic visitation. We were so proud of what we were able to do. But what we didn't realize is that we had planted an inn. And every year since then, people have come needing something from us to that end. And every year we've been able to give more and more and more because every year more people's talents and more people's inventory, what was in their hands has been added to it. And this last year we gave away over 3,000 uniforms. That's an unbelievable thing. We're filling the gap for our community. And we're doing it because we really believe that we're supposed to be the inn at the crossroads of life. Right now, we're going to watch a story about a young man within our community who has found purpose and has realized that what was in his hands is more powerful than he even thought. Can we take a look? Hi, my name is Jamal. I'm 22. And this is my story. So at the age of 18 is when I remember picking up a camera and I got inspired to do so by my dad. So I pick up a camera and I go to college. So about a year into college, I'm still shooting at this time, but I'm not taking it serious. 
until some of my friends that I met while I was in college tell me, Jamal, you're pretty good at this and you have an eye for it. And at that moment in time, I decide, you know what, maybe I should take this serious. So I do so. And not too long after, I get opportunities to shoot for some pretty big artists in the hip hop industry. And in doing that, I realized that maybe this could turn into something bigger than what I thought it could be. And maybe this could set me for life. So shortly after, I come to North Point for the first time with my brother. Um, we decided to just come check it out. So we walked through the doors and there's a few things that caught my attention. The first thing was just the diversity and the different people that were in the church from different age groups. Um, I've never been to a church like that. And then how they just loved on us and made us feel welcome and like we belonged. And so we walked through the doors, through worship, and we listened to Pastor Philip speak his message. And it's something like I've never heard a pastor preach the way that Pastor Philip does, and it connects with you, and he hits you right in your heart. So at that moment, at that time, I told my brother, like, we have to keep coming back here. I don't know what it is, but we have to keep coming back. So we come back, and we come back. And months later, I decided that I wanted to get plugged in and, you know, get involved in the church. So I see an ad for the summer internship, and I apply. I got accepted into the summer internship, and doing that, I got a taste of what it was like to not only do what I love, but also have a sense of purpose and meaning behind it and a reason why I was doing what I was doing. So I leave the internship and I get a call to go on tour with an artist that I always dreamed of working with. So of course I take the opportunity and I'm shooting his shows, his photos, my work is getting posted to his page. And at the end of this tour, I still felt this emptiness, this unfulfillment and like, I didn't have a sense of purpose in life, and to the point where I wanted to give up just being a creative altogether. Any photography work, any video, I was done with it. So a couple of weeks later, I met with Pastor Philip, and he gave me an opportunity to come on the team. I say yes, not really knowing what the future was going to hold or what was in store. So I start shooting photos and videos at North Point, editing the sermons, the coaches' corners, and any other creative things. And as I'm doing that, I'm starting to get back this sense of purpose because I'm not just sitting behind a computer screen putting out stuff for a lot of people to see, but I'm putting out the message of Jesus that's reaching hundreds of people that some of them I might not even see in my lifetime or be able to reach by just myself alone. But me creating what I'm creating and doing what I love and reaching all of those people, that's, that's a fulfillment that I couldn't find anywhere else but here at North Point. As I surrendered my skills to God and trusted Him with what He put in my hands, He began to grow me in different areas. I went from being this really introverted, quiet, and shy guy to singing on a student worship team, being a student leader, and now I'm even leading my own student group, which is something that I would have never thought I would be able to do, especially not on my own. But that just goes to show what God can do when you just give things to Him and you trust Him. And I, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do the things that I've done so far without North Point being in my corner. We all need to play our part. And, you know, so many times um, the supernatural of the end just looks like Jamal's story. Us taking what's in our hand and giving it to God to use. And there's so many people within our creative department who work in a variety of, of jobs across the city, but they lean in and they run cameras on Sunday and they do Instagram and they do Facebook and they do graphics and they do photos and they do videos and they do all kinds of different things for people like Jamal said, most of whom they'll never meet. But let me tell you what happens when somebody like Jamal just gives what he has to Jesus is we hear stories really every day. People who watch a sermon online and, and their hearts are touched or military families who are separated because of orders or whatever and they're able to go to church together because of technology. We have one lady who was in the first service, and she and her mom, um, who lives in another state, get to go to church together. Her mom leans in and 
and watches online and her mom hasn't gone to church in two decades. She watches every single Sunday with her daughter. Why is that important? Because you're meeting somebody's need with what's in your hand. What's in your hand today? What's your excuse for for not serving your community? You may say, is this just about your church? No, it's really not, but it also is. If this is your home, this is a place where you can grow and where you can expand and where you can learn and where you can lean in and find what you're looking for. But it's also about our community at large. What happens when we take what's in our hand and we dedicate it to God and we allow him to use it for the common good? We have a medical doctor here in the community who's also an unbelievable chef. I mean, he, he can cook. And every first Wednesday, he and this team of people, they, they cook and they feed all of us. He's just using his gifts to build community. We have administrators who throughout the week and even at home, you know those people who love spreadsheets? Those people? Yeah, Clarissa just said amen. She, lo- she loves some spreadsheets. They're just taking what's in their hand and they follow up with people and they send emails and they track things and so that nobody falls through the gaps and we're able to love really big and really on purpose. They're, what's in your hand? What's in your hand to give to the world? You are the tailor-made answer for a gap. You You are the tailor-made answer for a gap in our community. What an amazing thing. And it's such a privilege to watch God work all of our talents together for the greater good, to do something incredible in our midst. You know, one of the things I love about Jamal's story is that he, he talks about how how he grew in all these other areas. Because it's never just about the thing you start to do. It's about what God does in you in the process. It's about just leaning in and taking that first step, getting rid of that one excuse, not waiting till it's perfect and you know exactly what you want to do. You know, the key to serving is just finding something that needs to be done and doing it. It's super simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can just take a step and then watch what God does in your life. Will you stand with me? You know, in a room like this, I know that many of you probably came in hoping to maybe hear a message on hope or peace or joy or something that would meet your need where you are. You know, the best thing that you could do for your situation is to start serving. Yeah, but Destiny, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the difficulty. No, no, I'm telling you. If you lean into the purposes of God for your life, if you start just taking action to serve those around you, because that's the gospel, That's what Jesus asked us to be. He asked us to be the servant of all. If you just choose to lean in with your gift, whether it's the gift of giving or it's the gift of construction or it's the gift of whatever, if you just choose to take that step, God will begin to do something on the inside of you because the story doesn't have the disciples going hungry. See, when they chose to obey Jesus and begin to serve that bread and begin to serve that fish, they ended up filled up with more than enough too. God cares about where you are. He knows your struggle. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows about the marriage that's on the rocks. He knows about the kid that just won't listen. He knows that you might be at the wit's end with your marriage or your business or or whatever it is. He knows. He knows about the tears that you cry at night. He knows about the struggle with depression or anxiety or whatever it is. He knows. But his answer isn't just look more deeply on the inside. 
His answer for all of us is choose to live on purpose because that's how your life gets straightened out and aligned. And it's how you come into contact with people who can minister to you and who can teach you and who can help you. And you can get to know them and they'll rub off on you and they'll and you'll help them on their journey. And it's how we all get better together. We all come in as in seekers but it is part of God's will for our lives that we turn into innkeepers. And he'll continue to meet our needs all the way along the journey. Can you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? You know, I know that some of you walked in carrying some pretty heavy burdens. Just weighted down. Jesus is here for you. He's here for you. He loves you. He sees you. He cares for you. You are not forgotten. And if that's you and you just say, Destiny, I just want you to pray for me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you just say, Destiny, I carry a huge burden in this morning. And honestly, I just need prayer. And I just need you to take a minute and, and to pray for me. Maybe, maybe right now you carried in the original burden, the burden of sin where you don't know Jesus and you haven't started following him. This is for you. But maybe you just carried in a burden of worry or regret. And you go, I know I'm not meant to carry this. And I want to give it to Jesus right now. I want to do my part, but I don't want to try to do his part. I know I need him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? I just want to pray for you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. God, you see all the hands of the people. God, I just pray that right now that you would do a work. God, I pray that you would meet people exactly where they are. God, I pray that you would bring peace into their situation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would begin to speak to their hearts right now, that you would tell them who they are, that they are more than a conqueror, that you're going to be with them, that your peace is sufficient, that even if the circumstance does not change, that you're going to be with them in the midst of the storm. God, I pray right now that you would take away the um, regrets of the past and that they would lean into your grace for what has happened before. God, I pray for those who even walked in needing to forgive that right now they would do that. Lord, raise them. Take the burdens that we offer to you right now. God, we thank you that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is here in this place and available for us. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this place. Thank you, Father, that this simple act of just acknowledging that they need you is more than enough to have you run towards them. 